Hey gang, and welcome. Today, we're gonna to discuss what a process is, what are process variables, we're gonna define a couple of process variables that you may encounter in engineering, and we're gonna discuss several different types of flow rates that you will probably encounter when working with a process. So, to start, what is a process? A process is a set of operations to accomplish a particular objective. For example, maybe you wanna purify some water, Maybe we'll make some orange juice concentrate. We'll maybe make a cancer therapeutic to help treat people. Or maybe we're making a spirit. We're purifying our alcoholic solution. Whichever the case may be, all of these are examples of a process because I'm performing a set of operations to complete an objective. Now, I want to circle back to that spirit example where I'm, let's say, purifying ethanol. In that situation, what would happen is that I'm gonna be using a distillation unit. And for our distillation, what we're doing is we're separating out two different compounds based on the difference in their boiling points. So we're starting with water and ethanol, and since they have different boiling points, we can boil those two compounds and actually get a nice separation between the two. And in my example, I'm just gonna say that we have an ideal system where we can get a perfect separation. And so by having our water and ethanol enter into my process, the distillation unit, what will happen is that I will have ethanol separating out the top and I'll have water coming out the bottom, giving me a perfect separation, right? And now I completed my objective of purifying my ethanol and removing all the water from that solution. And in case you're curious of what that distillation column might be, might look like, I've got, a, I've got a representative picture over here. And so this is called a still and is commonly used when you're producing different types of spirits. Now, when we're operating a process, there's a couple of other items that we may be encountering, which are process variables. And a process variable is a measured value within a process that can affect the process's operation. So examples of process variables are temperature and pressure but there's also a few more that you may all encounter, such as density, specific volume, specific gravity, flow rates, and concentration. And so now what I wanna do is spend a little time defining some of these terms. So we'll start off with density. And you're probably already familiar with density. Density is a mass per volume. And the way we're gonna represent it with an equation is We've got density, which we're using the variable rho, equals our mass per volume. Now, when we deal with density, there's a couple of assumptions we're making when, depending on the state of our material. So for example, for solids and liquids, we're gonna be in, uh, assuming that we have an independent, it's independent of pressure and it varies slightly for temperature. Whereas for gases, it's gonna be highly dependent on temperature and pressure. So related to density is another process variable, which is called specific volume. Now, specific volume is the volume occupied per unit mass. It's the inverse of density. And the way that we describe it using an equation is we have a cursive V, which is representing specific volume, equals our volume divided by mass. Now, you may be wondering, if I have density, why would I ever need to use specific volume? Well, there are some times where the numbers may be easier to work with as a specific volume rather than density. Additionally, when you get to the energy balances and you enter into thermodynamics, you're going to encounter specific volume for completing some of your calculations. And that's why I threw specific volume in so that you're familiar with that term. Now, Another process variable that is tied in pretty heavily with density is something called specific gravity. And specific gravity is the ratio of a substance's density to a reference density. And for us, you, you write out specific gravity with the following equation, where we have specific gravity, Sg, is equal to rho over rho reference. So that's the rho is our density of the substance of interest divided by our reference density. And depending again on the state of your materials, you're gonna have a different reference substance. So for example, when you're dealing with solids and liquids, your, your row reference most commonly is going to be 
water at four degrees Celsius, in which case it's going to, our reference density is one gram per milliliter or a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. Those densities are the same. Now, when we're dealing with, with gases, in that case, our row reference is going to be different. And it's now going to be the density of air at the same respective temperature and pressure for as, as the gas you're dealing with. Now, something else to be aware of is that some of the times you may not, somebody may not be using the term specific gravity. Instead, they may be using another term called relative density. Do not be alarmed. It's okay. That relative density is the same thing as specific gravity. Some people just prefer to use the term relative density rather than specific gravity. But at the end of the day, it's all the same. Now, I'm gonna circle back to, the, to a process. It's not gonna be the same exact process that we were talking about before, but it's, it's a process. So back to our process. Now let's pretend we've got the engineer. That's you. And within there, you're overseeing a, a reactor. And in this case, we're making chemical X, which is those sun-like molecules that you see inside the reactor. And one of the big questions you have when working and overseeing this process is, how do we quantify materials going into and out of the unit? Hmm. What do we do about that? Okay, so we have to identify something that we can measure that's going into and out of the unit. So we've got a couple of options. We can look at the mass or the weight of material that's going into and out of our system. We could be looking at the volume of material going in and out. We could look at the number or the quantity, which is a little bit more challenging to measure. One type of number slash quantity that you could be measuring and is something we commonly will deal with in, on, the, on the chemical side are moles. So we've got a couple of different options of what we can be measuring for materials going into and out of a process. All right. And so there's a particular term that we deal with when quantifying materials going into and out of the process. And that term is a flow rate. That flow rate is the measurement of materials that are being transported into or out of our system. And when we deal with flow rates for a process, there's three major types of flow rates that we'll be working with. So the first one is a mass, which for a mass flow rate, it's your mass per, per time. We've got a molar flow rate. So now in this case, it's moles per time. And we've also got a volumetric flow rate. And ah, uh, yes, you guessed it. It's a volume per time. Now, when we work with these flow rates, there's a couple of caveats, conditions that we have to be mindful of when dealing with each flow rate, because this can mess up our calculations if we're not careful about our assumptions and making sure it's going to be a consistent flow rate going into and out of our process. So with these caveats for mass, we have to make sure that our mass doesn't change. We have to follow the conservation of mass and it's not changing when it goes, um, our mass flow rate doesn't change unless we take mass out of the system. Hmm. Now, when will we ever take mass out of our system? It's not often. Really, the only time you would ever lose mass within your system is when you're dealing with a, a nuclear reaction, right? Because we're dealing, we're converting some mass into energy. But for the sake of material and energy balances, and for the majority, if not almost all of the material you're ever working with, your mass flow rate is gonna be consistent. Material going in, your, or mass going in, is going to equal mass coming out. All right. Good deal. The next, uh, the next caveat is for molar flow rates. So with a molar flow rate, we have to be careful for when we have a reaction because a molar flow rate changes if there's a chemical reaction. The reason why is because when you look at the chemical reaction and you look at the stoichiometry, you may not have the same amount of moles coming out as you had coming in. Again, if the coefficients for your reactants and products are different, you're gonna have a different amount of moles exiting your reactor compared to what was going in. And so you wanna just be careful when you have a reaction, moles coming in does not necessarily mean moles coming out. And the final flow rate that we're, we, or final condition we wanna 
worry, uh, be mindful of is our volumetric flow rate. And so for a volumetric flow rate, we want to be careful because if there's ever a change in temperature and or pressure, that's going to change our volumetric flow rate. So our volumetric flow rate is a lot more sensitive to changes within our process and environment. And most of the time when you have to, if you have to choose between the flow rates you want to work with, I would highly recommend you deal with mass or molar flow rates because those are going to usually, those are going to be much more consistent in comparison to a volumetric flow rate. And so with that, that that's going to wrap up our lecture for the day. And just to recap, we define what a process is. We talked about process variables and we defined a couple of process variables and we discussed different types of flow rates and the caveats surrounding each flow rate. And with that, I just want to thank you a lot for tuning in and I'll see you on the next one.